Martin Agronsky with the story of a weapon we hope we'll never have to use, the Fleet Ballistic Missile System. It begins here in the sea, dark and unknown, spreading its boundaries over three-fourths of the Earth's surface. This is the natural environment for the Navy. And the weapons the Navy employs to carry out its traditional mission. In these depths, there is only one vehicle that can constantly move and sustain itself for extended periods of time without reliance upon the Earth and the air. Silent, swift, capable of shifting position hundreds of miles within hours, the submarine can probe the continental shelves and oceanic mountain ranges from equator to pole. But fitting a ballistic missile inside a submarine poses a problem, particularly when each submarine would need to carry many such missiles. Solving this problem only pointed out many more. In order to launch these missiles accurately, the submarine must know its exact position at all times without resort to the accustomed means of navigation such as the STARS or LORAN and radar. And the launch must take place far beneath the ocean's surface. Once launched, the missile must be able to operate completely on its own, already programmed with its electronic intelligence that will command it to arc into the correct ballistic trajectory for destroying virtually any military target on Earth. But a ballistic missile is only as effective as its launching device and the men who man it. This human factor plays just as important a role in the overall program as the submarine and its missile. Can a submarine crew live and work in confined quarters for months at a time? What are the human factors? This is the concept, the submarine and ballistic missile working together as a single system, united by a maze of complex electronics and the ever-present factor of human engineering. Put them all together and they present the first fleet ballistic missile system. Major engineering breakthroughs enable the Navy to transform this concept into equipment. Nuclear power advances by the Bureau of Ships and the Atomic Energy Commission give the missile-carrying submarine the endurance so important to its mission. A new method of navigating the ocean depths is developed. Inertial navigation, a system of precision-made gyroscopes, accelerometers and computers, completely self-sustained, enabling the submariner to know exactly where he is at any time without reference to the stars or radio navigation. Other developments increase the endurance of the submarine. New ways to purify the air and improve the atmosphere. Better ways to increase human endurance and shorten the long hours beneath the sea. With these and many more engineering features, nuclear-powered submarines are now ready to demonstrate the capabilities that will be needed by the missile-carrying submarine. Sea Wolf. 60 days beneath the sea without surfacing. Nautilus, whose historic voyage of exploration takes the Navy far beneath the Arctic ice pack and across the top of the world to the North Pole. Skate, actually surfacing at the North Pole. Proof that the farthest reaches of the Earth's oceans will be accessible to the FBM submarine. But how can the submarine employ a ballistic missile? The Navy's experience in guided missiles had shown that surfacing to launch a missile exposes a submarine to detection and attack at a time when it is at least able to defend itself. Universities, the Navy, and industry mobilize their knowledge and skills in a highly accelerated program.
systems and subsystems are developed. These and thousands of other precision components are manufactured and incorporated into systems that must be taken to the many test facilities supporting the Polaris program. For launching Polaris, industry develops a missile eject system. Operation Pea Shooter proves out this technique. But will the launcher work underwater? On Operation Pop-Up, engineers find out. Deep beneath these boys is a pea shooter, loaded and ready to go. A heavy cruiser steams by to create turbulence in the water over the launch site. Another goal is achieved in the Polaris program. You can test uh, dummy missiles this way, but what about the real thing? How can you recover a costly Polaris, undamaged so it can be tested and uh, tested again? Here's one solution, Operation Skycatch. Already it has saved millions in the Navy's constant effort to prove out this complex weapon system as rapidly and economically as possible. Operation Fishhook is another important test facility. Here, a launched Polaris missile can actually be snatched in mid-air, so engineers can determine how its instruments perform from ejection to the peak of its launch trajectory. But before live missiles can go to sea, Polaris must undergo extensive testing ashore. Its engines must be proved and improved, so the missile has the power to deliver its deadly load. These high-energy solid rocket fuels represent another major breakthrough. A motor case designed to withstand the tremendous heat is also developed. And the result is an ever-improving rocket engine for the Navy's ballistic missile. As the program accelerates, facilities are expanded rapidly to flight test the missile. Here on the Navy's pad at Cape Canaveral, Misselman ready another Polaris for the latest in a series of flights designed to test the many components that make up the missile's engine, controls, and guidance system. These test vehicles are the AX series. They will give the engineers proof of how the missile will perform under actual flight conditions. And now, Polaris is checked from its highly instrumented nose cone down through its complex electronic airframe to its powerful motor, and then... Minus 20 seconds. Engineers must also ask themselves, how does Polaris react to the rolling, pitching motion of the sea? And so they build a device they call a ship motion simulator, which packs into its movements all the motions usually reserved for the sailor and his ship. Then in test ejections of dummy missiles and later in actual firings from the simulator, they find answers to their questions and in answers, solutions that bring Polaris closer to the day it can join the fleet. The first Polaris missiles go to sea in a converted merchant ship, the Observation Island. In this floating laboratory, proof is being obtained that the system's critical elements can function 
in the environment of the sea. And today, a new naval weapon, the ballistic missile, takes sea power into space. Each success, each failure too, gives engineers and technicians the lessons they need to bring the system closer to operational readiness. This information is exchanged between the armed services and contractors, so developments from these continuing tests can be carried over into other programs to further the nation's ballistic missile capabilities. Soon, the missile will be mated to the nuclear submarines now under construction in shipyards on both coasts. Already, the first of these new warships has come down the way. Uh, Chris and the George Washington. Navy men are being trained for the blue and gold crews of the FBM submarine. These are the technicians that will man this complex weapon system. Weapons of today for the security of tomorrow, each integrated into the larger weapon system of the American defense team. This, then, is the goal. Operational Polaris carrying submarines manned and on station. A silent, mobile, elusive force shielded by the sea, immune to ballistic missile attack, but instantly ready to mount an overwhelming blow at the important centers of any enemy's land-based power. <laughs> 